Right. My disclaimer is just once again, I don't have the magic wand. I don't have the magic wand where I can all of a sudden just fix things. But I would like to give you different perspectives and that will hopefully pave the way for you to do things differently better. And please, my invitation to you to reflect. In terms of the content, how are you gauging your life and where are the gaps that you see you need to work on? I want to start off by sharing with you some food for thought. Some of the things I'm going to share with you are common sense. Okay, no question. Absolutely it is. But I want to invite you to do a gap analysis, um, just touching on the previous point, of identifying those one or two areas where you feel you can work on and adopt an approach of the lowering fruit that you can tackle by specifically honing in on those areas where you've got a, the biggest gap between where you are and where you would like to find yourself. I'm going to share with you some theory and practice, but frankly, I don't really want to focus on the theory because the theory you can typically Google. I want to focus on the practical side of things. And I'm not the expert, only expert in the room. There are a lot of you in this virtual room, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your views at the end as well. I want to kick off and by asking you two questions. If you have to, upon personal reflection, ask yourself the following. First of all, on a scale from 1 to 10, how good are you? How good am I at mastering good communication skills or healthy communication skills? And then secondly, what can I change to improve the score? So we cannot doubt the importance of communication skills. If we just Google, we see, I mean, there are many. Some websites say there are 5, 10, 11, whatever the number is of communication skills. And in fact, if you look at the, at the number that's underlined there, if you Google communication skills, you get 1.3 billion hits. So if we define communication, according to the Oxford Online Dictionary, and by the way, if you type in communication, you would see 4.7 billion hits. Communication is the imparting or exchanging of information by speaking, writing, or using other forms or, of, of communication or, or mediums, rather. So what are communication skills then? Well, communication skills are our abilities or the abilities that we use when giving and receiving different kinds of information. And I want to skip to the bottom where I've underlined the last couple of lines. And I think that's actually and should be a call to action for all of us to actively practice ways to improve our communication over time because that will lead and that will support us in achieving our personal and professional goals. I've got no doubt, and I'm sure you would agree with me, that effective communication supports achieving results. And I'll share a little bit of theory with you from a website called EB Offices, but I like this, this uh, article that was, this blog that was written. First of all, they say, the first top trait of a good communicator is to be self-aware. You and I sometimes need to say, but hang on, pause. Would it add any value if I say something now? Because it might not. And frankly, then it's not necessary to, to communicate. Or if I then do communicate, if it wasn't necessary, I might just steer the conversation in the wrong direction. Being clear and concise. I used to be, and I'm to an extent still do that, I could, I could start a story way far further than I should actually start it. Be specific, be clear, be concise. Don't waffle. And being confident. If you want to share something with me or sell an idea and you're not confident in your own abilities in presenting it or getting it across, I, would I then be confident that what you're trying to tell me is the right thing to do? Using empathy, putting yourself in the other person's shoes because we very often, when we communicate, we only want to see our own views and put our own views forward. And then good listening skills, which might sound like an obvious one, but we often fail at that, and I'll get to that a little bit, um, back a little bit in more detail. But that's theory to an extent. So let's talk about what I would like to share with you. And I really want to share with you the things that works for me. And I want to share with you literally four golden nuggets that I've over and over in my life came across that I believe are the things that, that frankly, we, we should be mastering as part of being able to have healthy communication skills. 
And I know it's very late, but I'm just admitting a couple of more people as a final admission. Right, so types of communication, just briefly. Verbal, nonverbal, written communication, and we all can probably confess that we suffer from death by email. And I think too many times we are trying to cover our backsides and we create cultures and organizations where it's necessary. And for no one second, I'm saying we should not communicate in writing, but I think we over communicate in writing unnecessarily. And then obviously visual, visual communication is what you are experiencing now also in terms of the video that I'll share with you a little bit later. But really my focus in terms of our session today, I want us to focus on verbal communication. Golden nugget, hopefully, number one. And I think this is so important. I think it's, in fact, it's the most important thing is that we create the right atmosphere for communication to take place. Open and honest feedback. We need to invite it. We need to encourage it, I want to say. We need to encourage open communication, which is simply the ability of individuals to freely convey their thoughts and ideas to each other. Obviously, in a constructive manner. And I would like to put forward that if this is not part of your corporate, your organizational culture, then it's a serious problem. Came across this quote recently, leadership is action, not position. If you as a senior person or the CEO or the MD think you can, you've got a title and therefore you can communicate as you would like to or create a corporate environment where you don't encourage open communication, I always want to say shame on you because your organization will not be sustainable or you would not as an individual or as a collective achieve what you can potentially achieve. I've worked with too many organizations in the past where there's too much of a fear of consequence. Shouldn't be a fear of consequence. We should encourage open communication. I think that's the most probably the most important thing around communication. We should create that environment. It should be part of our DNA, part of our organizational and team cultures. Golden nugget number two, I hope, once again, is dealing with feedback. You see, when we listen to somebody, especially if it's criticism or negative feedback, we very quickly assume. We start then to, to listen selectively and the shutters go down because we are getting emotional about what we selectively hear. And I always say, if you, especially in a case like that, where you get negative feedback, listen and then paraphrase. Say to that person, just to check my understanding, is this and this and this what you mean? Because very often, because we don't properly listen, when we start to realize it's negative feedback or criticism, very often we don't get the right message. And then you might be driving in a car to, with that person three years later, and you would, might say to that person on your way to that meeting, remember that thing you told me three years ago? And a person will tell you, but hang on, I can't even remember it. Or I do remember it, but that's not what I meant. So paraphrase and make sure you get the right message. And soundboard, if you don't agree with the message you got, ask somebody to trust to ask them if, if, if they want to give you honest feedback in terms of what you heard from person A and if they agree with that feedback. Because very often we've got blind spots and we're not aware of the things that we should actually be focusing on as part of our developmental journey. Number three, yes, but, and pause before you engage. Stephen Covey said, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. And that might be true in your case. And I think as, as a general trend, we don't listen enough. I used to be a yes, but person. Maybe to an extent I'm still one, but I seriously know that, you, that, you, that it used to be one of my flaws. And I would very quickly, when somebody said something, say yes, but, and not realizing in saying that, I'm frankly discounting whatever they told me, showing no, dis no respect. So maybe it's too much information, but I'm going to share it in any case. So Marley and I have the good, my wife and I have the good habit of bathing, bathing together every night. We were lying in the bath one night, a year and a half ago probably, two years ago maybe, and she told me a story about her day. And as soon as she stopped 
a story of another story of my day. And then she told me, but hang on, don't you want to, even if you didn't listen to what I said, don't you want to just wait for three seconds? Because then at least you create the impression that you listened to what I told you. So what I do now is I do what the old rugby referees used to say when they set the scrum. Pause. One, two, three, and then I engage. And if anything, for any other reason, there are two very good reasons. First of all, to show respect, to show at least the other person that you have listened to what they said. And I think secondly, and probably as, as, as or even more importantly, to consider that your view might not be the only view. If you're, for example, talking about the same issue, as opposed to saying yes, but really listen and really almost want to say evaluate the other person's view. Because guess what? We've got so much pride and we think we only have the right solutions. We only have the right answers, and that's so wrong. And by pausing before you engage, you at least give yourself time to process if the other person's view or potential solution might not be the better one for you as a team, for you as an individual. Even. Just give me a shout, as always, if you can't hear the sound. I did click sound, so it should, should be fine. Nelson Mandela is a particularly special case study in the leadership world because he is universally regarded as a great leader. You can take other personalities and depending on the nation you go to, we have different opinions about other personalities. But Nelson Mandela across the world is universally regarded as a great leader. He was actually the son of a tribal chief. And he was asked one day, how did you learn to be a great leader? And he responded that he would go with his father to tribal meetings. And he remembers two things when his father would meet with other elders. One, they would always sit in a circle. And two, his father was always the last to speak. You will be told your whole life that you need to learn to listen. I would say that you need to learn to be the last to speak. I see it in boardrooms every day of the week. Even people who consider themselves good leaders, who may actually be decent leaders, will walk into a room and say, here's the problem, here's what I think, but I'm interested in your opinion, let's go around the room. It's too late. The skill to hold your opinions to yourself until everyone has spoken does two things. One, it gives everybody else the feeling that they have been heard. It gives everyone else the ability to feel that they have contributed. And two, you get the benefit of hearing what everybody else has to think before you render your opinion. The skill is really to keep your opinions to yourself. If you agree with somebody, don't nod yes. If you disagree with somebody, don't nod no. Simply sit there, take it all in, and the only thing you're allowed to do is ask questions so that you can understand what they mean and why they have the opinion that they have. You must understand from where they are speaking why they have the opinion they have, not just what they are saying. And at the end, you will get your turn. It sounds easy, it's not. Practice being the last to speak. That's what Nelson Mandela did. When I prepared for this webinar, ladies and gents, I came across this book topic or this book cover, Golden, The Power of Silence. Sometimes I almost want to say to you, challenge yourself, dare yourself to not immediately respond and to let the silence just play out. When we do leadership coaching, we always say that silence should not be awkward. See what might happen, what might come out of a conversation. That last bit that the other person didn't want to really convey to you, but that is so valuable. And if you respect the silence, it will come out and it will add value. Golden nugget, I hope, once again, number four. And the question is, should, you message, should your message, what you convey, should it land softly? Now, for those of you that I've coached that might be in this room, I have to apologize because I used to say, and I used to have the view that it should always land softly. 
because we want to create a harmonious working environment, right? No, not necessarily. So this morning, when I was sitting outside because it was hot, I was sitting on our, on our stoop and having my jungle oats, I was thinking about this. And I, to answer the question, should your words or your communication always land softly, I came to the realization it depends. And let me explain further. Because what I was thinking of at that point was, in the context of situational leadership, which is a leadership philosophy or style that I very much promote and like, and I would like, this, the purpose of this session is not to focus on situational leadership, but please go and read up more about it. But I just took a clip from a video that I have on situational leadership, one of the videos, and it is really about, in the, in the context also of that question, it, it depends. It depends on the context and the person. Because here's the thing, if the bu building is burning down, I'm not going to try and be kind and let it land softly. I'm really going to be very direct and very autocratic to get you out, to get you out of that building as soon as I, I possibly can for the right reasons. Conversely, if I, take to, if I talk to my three-year-old toddler or two-year-old toddler, then it will land softly. And I'll, I'll make, it, make sure, in most cases at least, it will land softly. So what's my message? Is simply that we need to be aware of the fact that we need to adjust the way we communicate depending on the context and depending on the person that we are dealing with. When I convey these soft skills areas to you in these sessions, session number 14 uh, today, 14 months we've been doing this and the plan is to carry on as long as we possibly can uh, and, and to, in fact, frankly not to stop. Hard skills like kicking a ball, like riding a car, driving a car, riding a motorcycle are things that we practice. And we very often neglect the fact that soft skills are exactly the same. My ability to communicate, my ability to take control of my emotions, to live a disciplined life, etc., 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 interacting with other people specifically, if we define soft skills, all these things we can practice and get better at and master. Don't let our past define us. We can grow, we can learn, we can improve. Like we certif get a certificate. certificate that we can hang up against the wall, that we we have mastered a specific hard skill or in terms of a career, I'm an accountant or a lawyer or engineer or medical doctor. I cannot get a university degree in communication. Maybe maybe you, you do get, that's maybe the exception, degree in communication, but certainly not necessarily as far as the execution side of it's concerned, is concerned in terms of mastering communication in terms of mastering any one of the soft skills that I've mentioned and more. I think first and foremost, we need to certify ourselves by practicing and practicing to the point where we, and also, yes, based on feedback from other people, get to a point where we master it. Publish the book on this stuff. If you're interested, please register on soldati.com or send me a mail if you're not already on the on my distribution list uh, for future free Friday lunch webinars. We are taking a break. I think it's time for all of us to take that break, well-deserved break. I want to kick off on the 26th of Jan with goal setting and goal achievement in 2024 and beyond. And then the February session is not called Please Let Me Know. Please, I would love to hear from you where you would like me to focus on in preparing something that might assist you and give you the tools and te techniques and methods to master something that you are finding very challenging at this point. Ladies and gents, that's the end. I want to thank you. Uh, please ask me to join you on your network or vice versa on LinkedIn. Those are my details, and I'm going to stop at this point to share. And I want to invite you as the other experts in the room, because I'm certainly not the only expert in the room, to please share your comments, disagreements, uh, anything. Nicky, can you hear me? Devon, I can hear you. Thanks for breaking, well, that, that, thanks for <laughs> breaking that silence. And, and, no and problem. Sure while, while, the others, while the others get their courage together, I think just one important thing 
um, that I've picked up in recent times, and I think we've all seen it, we've probably all experienced it, but the levels of depression and not being okay is shooting through the roof at the moment. Yeah. When it comes to communication, I want to urge you as colleagues of other people um, to, to just ask the question, are you okay? Yeah. And, and then to take time and to take that pause and to listen for that answer. Um, you know, it, it might just be that question that um, changed the, the course of somebody's life. Mm. Um, just ask the question, are you okay? Uh, reach out to see people getting more quiet than usual. Uh, there might be something um, that, that must be done about that. So perhaps you are that person that, that will, will be able to help or direct them to somebody that can. So please, please ask that question. Thanks. Stephen, thanks to you, because I think it's such an important point that you make. Um, yeah, we all are responsible and ultimately we're accountable also for the people in our teams and our organizations and our, our circles where we operate in. And don't, don't turn a blind eye when you see somebody's battling. Do what Stefan suggested, because um, you, you, you might not have any idea what massive difference that, that could make. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah. Ladies and gents, anybody else? Um, comments, your experiences. Like I said, I'm certainly not the only expert in the room. I share with you what worked for me and what I think is important that we master. And we can obviously keep on talking about communication for days because it's such a such a massive uh, topic that's got so much detail in it. If I could ask a question, please, Sharon. I just get your opinion. Yeah. Um, in my in my company. While I am one of the managers and on the sort of mid to senior leadership, mm. and I can certainly help by fostering and creating a environment where people communicate better within yeah. my teams. What um, suggestions do you have when the upper management, the exco, are not creating that environment. So it's very much a case of you go into a meeting with a CEO or a COO or even our CFO, mm. and it's straight to the business. There's a lot of sort of downloading of information and they leave and you've got, you know, work to do. How can I work upwards yeah. to change a culture um, when unfortunately it is a situation where the CEO will decide that something's not working and he'll change mm. it. And you sort of have to catch up. And that's always been the culture. Yeah. What can I do upwards um, if I'm not in control of that? Yeah. Very, very good point, Sharon. Thanks a lot. Uh, there is a thing called upward accountability. Um, and, and and it's not an easy, easy answer because A, they've got positional power, am I right? And B, they've been doing this for all their lives. So... All I can encourage you to do is it starts with self. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you would like to see in the world. And whenever you are in forums, create that environment that you wish for. And I want to go one step further. If you ask in, a, in forums where they are, are involved, plant the seed and hope, in the hope that it will come to fruition and it will grow in the sense of maybe asking the question, Shouldn't we ask everybody's opinion around the table uh, in terms of what we're talking about here? Because there might be valuable input. And I want to, always want to say to you, box cleverly around that. And now again, ask the question that might lead to shifts as far as that's concerned. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps, Sharon. That does. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. A good one. Thank you. Right. Um, ladies and gents, I'm going to close it off there because I promised to finish it off post. You've got my details. Give me a shout if you want to check in with me. Uh, thanks once again for supporting these sessions. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in Jan. Please register or make sure you drop me an email or make sure you're part of the distribution list that I've accumulated. And uh, if we don't see each other again, I wish you all the best and a, a Merry Christmas, a blessed Christmas. Christmas and a, a family time and, and, and a very, very prosperous 2024, despite all the challenges that we are faced with um, that, that's going around. Thank you, Eki. Blessings.